Hello, my name is Bercy Vigen. I'm a research fellow in online harms at the Alan Turing Institute, where I work on projects uh, relating to online hate, online misinformation, and online extremism. Uh, I'm here today to talk about our work on understanding and countering vulnerability to health-related misinformation during COVID-19. And before I get going, I'd really like to just thank everyone who's been involved in this project. Uh, and this includes Becky Inkster, who's based at Cambridge and the Turing, uh, Mirto Pantazi, who's a postdoctoral researcher at Oxford, Zoe Anastasiou, who's one of our research assistants at the Turing, Helen Markets, who's a professor at Oxford and also director of the public policy programme at the Turing, and Harry Taylor, who's uh, a PhD student at the Man at Manchester University and also an RA at the Turing. So really a huge thank you to everyone who's been involved um, and also many other people who aren't listed here, such as uh, Pauline, who's just done all of the work in making this project possible uh, on the back end. I'd also like to say that we're very generously funded by the Health Foundation, who really uh, gave us a grant to carry out this work at the start of the pandemic, which let us move forward very quickly with it, and also the Alan Turing Institute, who gave us some funding uh, to make sure that we could put the time aside to really make this work. So I'd like to start by giving a little bit of background. Um, now, of course, we all know that governments have taken very drastic action to tackle COVID-19. Uh, they want to slow its spread, they want to minimise its impact, both in terms of health and also the uh, economy and wider society. And it's crucial during this time that people can access reliable and trustworthy information. Uh, the official guidance is changing rapidly, there's new evolving threats which are coming online, our understanding is changing, I think also the way that people are thinking about scientific knowledge is changing, and um, the specific details are changing as well. So I'm sure that no one six months ago was thinking about the R value outside of the public health experts, um, and now that's something that we're all quite familiar with. But one of the things that we noticed at the start of this project is just how much research is going on into the supply side factors. And by supply side, I mean the people who are sharing, who are promulgating, who are pushing this content. And there's been a lot of work into how much uh, misinformation is there. And that's, of course, a hugely important side of the picture. We need to have a sense of not only who's spreading it, but how much and why, where they're going to spread it, what the patterns are. This is all crucial information. But we also need to know the other side of the coin. What are the demand side factors? Why are people believing this content? How much are they believing this content? And which people are believing this content? Because if we don't know both sides of the story, then we're gonna really struggle to develop the right policy interventions and to inform public discourse. I think related to this is what's the true impact? If we don't have both these bits of information, if we don't have the supply side and the demand side, we aren't gonna be able to really evaluate um, the, the true impact of health-related misinformation. And that means we're not going to be able to develop ways of protecting people and making sure that they make the best decisions possible. But I think I'd like to just uh, take a step back before I launch into what we're actually doing here, which is just to ask, what even is misinformation? Now, my background is in political science. And in political science, misinformation is one of those, uh, sort of the, the bogeyman of the, of the research field, where... A lot of people want to claim that misinformation is the problem, that if only we had a better informed uh, populace, if only citizens could really agree on the fundamental facts and the fundamental problems, we might be able to move democratic debate forward and we might be able to reach better policy, have less polarised discussions. A whole slew of positive things would follow from eradicating misinformation. And of course, at the exact same time, there's a body of thought which says, well, no, sadly, that's probably not the case, because when we disagree about facts, we're often disagreeing about values and ideologies and beliefs. And those things are really, really difficult to tackle. And because they're so difficult to tackle, the misinformation is so diff difficult to tackle. And I give the example here of the dress. And this went viral a couple of years ago. Um, and it went viral because no one could agree what colour it is. Now, I see that as blue and gold, some people see it as black, some people white, some people a whole uh, rainbow of colours. And this really gets to the fundamental problem that we have, which is that we can't agree on the basic facts. And if you can't agree on the basic facts, it's very, very hard to move forward. There's also this other problem, which is that 
The things which are misinformation are incredibly good now at hiding the fact that they're misinformation. So this is a photo of someone who does not exist. In fact, it's from the website, thispersondoesnotexist.com. Uh, it was generated with some very advanced AI, but also some very easy to get hold of AI, it has to be said. Um, and it's very hard to tell that this is not a real person. So these are the kind of debates that we have to encounter normally when we're talking about misinformation, recognition that there's some real epistemic uncertainty when it comes to making any kind of claim about the way that things are and the process which, which led them to be. However, I'd like to uh, put forward the argument, if I can, that things are a little bit different when it comes to a health crisis and a pandemic. And yes, of course, we have to recognise that there is no such thing as complete certainty. Even in uh, health and many other areas of science, there are huge areas of disagreement and uncertainty and contestation. And this isn't just as simple as going into your dictionary of, of scientific facts and pulling out what it says about how we tackle these problems. Um, we're always going to have to make tough decisions. I don't think we can ever just let the science speak for itself. So with all of those caveats aside to show that I'm trying not to be too reductive about this, I'd still like to make the argument that when we're talking about health during a global uh, crisis such as we're facing at the moment, actually we can start to say that some things are true and some things are false. Or it's, at the very least, some things have much, much better evidence than other things do. Um, and this, of course, has a real tangible consequence. And I think this is perhaps the key point to this research, is that people believing misinformation has a real impact on their health and well-being. And this is not the time for people to be misinformed and to be making poor decisions. Um, and I give an example which actually predates COVID, which is about the anti-vax movement. Um, I'd like to say straight away, this is an example of anti-vaccination misleading content. It's from the World Health Organization. They share it so that people can understand what it is that we're dealing with. And it says, vaccines cause many harmful side effects, illnesses, and even death, not to mention possible long-term effects we don't even know about. And this is the sort of misinformation that we're often countering. It's not that it's got some simplistic part of it which is directly false. And I can say, look, definitively, there are never any harmful side effects. Um, and there will never be any long-term effects, and we know all about every single thing which is going to happen. But when you put that in the context of people trying to make decisions, it can be quite harmful because they're now believing something which leads them to not vaccinate their kids, which on balance is probably a much more dangerous um, outcome. So I just had to definitely a misleading statement with some real tangible consequences. And we've already seen that the anti-vax movement, which uh, goes all the way back to the 18th century, is going to cause problems, or that's the belief. So uh, there's an article in Nature about this back in early May. But what about COVID? So let's talk about some of the uh, false information that we've seen. And this is from Ofcom, and they've done some fantastic reporting around the uh, spread of misinformation. And they say that drinking more water can flush out the infection. Well, that's a false claim. Uh, COVID can be treated by gargling with salt water. That's another false claim. COVID can be treated by avoiding cold food and drink. And of course, the question is, you know, so if we look at this from a supply side factor, we can see that 24% of people have been exposed to this. There's probably someone out there pushing this information. This is going to be quite widespread across social media. But how many people actually believe this content? How many people think that drinking more water can flush out the infection? Is it 1%? Is it 10%? Is it 0.0001% of the population? We don't know. We don't know who those people are who might be susceptible to this. Um, and I, just to reiterate the point, so if we have half of UK adults exposed to false claims about coronavirus, that doesn't really tell us how many of those people believed the false claims. And I'd also add that there is a very serious methodological problem with trying to understand content in this way, because this report was based on a survey that they administered, um, and as, as surveys go, it's, it's a great survey. But asking someone if they've been exposed to false claims is difficult because a truly false claim, a truly effective false claim, you wouldn't even recognise. You wouldn't know that you've been exposed to it. The problem is not people... The, the problem is not the claims that you know are false, and so you're like, okay, fine, don't believe that, put that away in some other part of my brain. It's the claims which you think have some legitimacy or some validity. And I just add that the government has done some things to tackle this. So we have the share checklist, uh, which advises you to scrutinise and reflect on what you're sharing. 
Um, I'd also add that the Center for Countering Digital Hate has done some fantastic work uh, trying to make people more aware of what they're uh, being exposed to and exposing others to. And then there are some great monitoring tools like this from NewsGuard and loads of organizations have, have got these out. So you can understand where the misinformation is coming from, which platform it's big on, who's pushing it out, how much there is. Um, so, so there are some very positive things which are happening, which are helping us to get a better handle on the situation. But, because there is always a but with any good academic talk, there are some limitations as to what we know. And I said there that we have some sense of how much is being pushed out. So again, we have some sense of the supply side. We don't know how big the problem is on the demand side. We don't know who's most at risk. We also don't really know what works in tackling it. So whilst it certainly is a good idea to be encouraging people to scrutinize and to reflect on what they're seeing, we don't really know whether that's the best intervention point, whether that's the best way of tackling this. Maybe it's not just about equipping citizens to scrutinize what they see more. Maybe it's also about trying to stop having this content out there and getting the platforms to be more involved in its regulation. Maybe it's not even a question of just scrutinizing it more. Maybe it's also about actually giving people the health literacy to tackle this. There are many different uh, options and avenues that we can take here. And I think we need more evidence to really understand them. Uh, and I'll add that we're, we're going to focus mostly on who is most at risk in our current research. So again, uh, I seem to be king of caveats today, but I should add that we aren't the first people to look at this. Um, you never are. There's been some fantastic work over the last few years. Um, from people, especially in social psychology, trying to understand the traits and the personality features and other socioeconomic and socio-demographic factors associated with people who are vulnerable to this sort of content. There's also been some work in the computational social sciences trying to understand how it manifests uh, in, in real empirical settings. So what are the research questions that we are addressing? Well, we have two, and you'll see that I've highlighted two words there, one people, uh, the second content, because that's really the key difference between them. So the first research question, what factors are associated with people who are more likely to believe health-related misinformation? And here we're looking at things such as your, your background, your, your, some of your cognitive traits, your personality, um, they're traits which are sort of you as an individual. The second question is what features are associated with false health related content that people erroneously believe is true? And in this case, we're shifting the focus. So if the first question really requires a between subjects design, so we need to see differences between the people that we're studying, the first one, so the second one is more to do with a within subject design. So if I show one single person some content, um, how will the different features of that content lead them to believe it to be true or false in systematic ways? Uh, I should add that we have an open science framework approach here. So we've, we're currently in the process, actually, of pre-registering our study. And we want to keep this as transparent and to be as hypothesis-driven as possible. So what we are doing? Well, in very simple terms, we have a survey and we have some experiments. And the experiments are, are very simple. It's just looking at some vignettes we've constructed of different types of content. We've administered all of this through Qualtrics, um, which has made life fairly straightforward. Uh, we have a pilot study going out and then that feeds into a full study in the future. So hypothesis one, and I should just add that this is all for research question one. So the factors um, that are associated with people who are more likely to believe health related misinformation. So hypothesis one, institutional trust. And here we've tried to construct a slightly more uh, sort of nuanced way of looking at it. But essentially our view uh, is that belief in health, sorry, belief in, belief in conspiracy theories is gonna have an inverse relationship with your susceptibility. So the more that you believe in the conspiracy theories, um, the more that you will be susceptible. We've also got factors here for institutional trust. Um, institutional trust is uh, something which is fairly hard to measure um, in a more general sense. So we've tied it into institutional trust of the UK government. Um, and we also have openness to experience, which is a personality trait. 
And there seems to be from the previous lit literature some kind of combination around if you have low institutional trust and you're very open to new experiences, uh, which is often a very positive thing, you might at the same time be willing to believe in conspiracy theories and off-piste uh, viewpoints. And in most settings, this is absolutely fine. This is just a question of personal taste and interest. And of course, we all have our own um, concerns. But the, the issue here is, of course, when it becomes related to health-related misinformation, there is an opportunity for you to make very poor decisions um, because you're not willing to trust expert advice in a setting where expert advice is crucial. Brilliant. So I'll go on to uh, the second hypothesis, which is health literacy. And here our hypothesis is quite simple, that um, actual health-related literacy, so the more health literate you are, the less susceptible you should be. What I think makes this a particularly interesting question for us is that we're going to have, well, we have two measures. So one is actual health literacy. And for that, there's a fairly simple test. We have 40 words, which are a jumble of genuine medical terms and made up medical terms. You have to separate the two out. And, and you find that people who have much higher health literacy or who are much uh, more likely to say to be a trained medical professional, they're very good at separating out the true and the false claims and people who who aren't uh, really struggle with it. And I think as part of this, we've also then got your self-perceived health literacy. So then we've got you to rate how how literate do you think you are? And having the combination of those two things is really powerful because that means that we have a way of saying, you know, and our, our hypothesis here is that people who have quite low health literacy, but who think that they they do, so their actual health, lit health literacy is low, but their self-perceived health literacy is very high, they're going to be the most susceptible because they, you know, they kind of think they're better than they are. The third one is cognitive skills and digital literacy. Um, and these are somewhat separate factors. So the literature here, so the literature here gives slightly competing views. So cognitive skills certainly seems to be plausible that if you have higher cognitive skills, you're going to be less susceptible because perhaps you're a more critical thinker and you're more well equipped intellectually to really gauge and evaluate these things. However, it seems to be that that isn't the case, actually, and lots of studies are showing that cognitive skills do not play a particularly important role. And the proposed reasons for that is that this sort of misinformation works at a much more emotive level. It's not just about you scrutinizing the content and trying to critically evaluate it. It's just, does it, you know, do you believe it in the moment? Does it take you? Does it somehow feed into any of your concerns or your fears, which a lot of the health-related misinformation does? Um, the other factor is digital literacy. And here our anticipation is that greater digital literacy reduces your susceptibility. And I should add that part of the reason for that is because a lot of the health-related misinformation we see is to do with, say, speculative content, satire. People saying things as a joke to try and draw attention and they're sort of laughably um, incorrect. Now, of course, the more digitally literate that you are, the more likely you are to be able to pick up on that and to understand the content for really what it is. Um, if you're perhaps not very literate and you're not used to being online, there's a good chance you won't really understand that there's this thing called internet culture and a whole set of things called, you know, the uh, animal memes and shit posting and a whole world of people who enjoy spreading misinformation, not because they actually want to cause anyone harm, but just because they perhaps think it's funny. And then fourth, uh, hypothesis for personal vulnerability to COVID. So actually, I'll just want to be very clear here. This is actually a mistake on the slide. Um, this is the same as before for cognitive skills and digital literacy. Um, but we didn't, I, I think it's just a mistake when I made this. So my apologies for that. But with personal vulnerability, uh, there's basically two views on this from the previous literature. One is that the more vulnerable you are, so if you're, say, an older person or someone who's um, got a heart condition or a breathing condition, um, you'll actually be less vulnerable to misinformation because you're going to be really clued up about it and you're going to have spent a lot of time to familiarise yourself with the relevant information um, and you're going to scrutinise things a lot more because it really makes a very uh, immediate and tangible impact on your well-being. That's one side of the story. The other side of the story actually is that um, because you're so close to it, because you're so heavily invested and involved in this issue, you might... Um, 
you might be more susceptible to misinformation because it grabs you a lot more. It makes you really, it really gets you much more worked up and so reduces your ability to think about it critically. Now, our view is that we've we've gone with the idea that people who are more vulnerable will also, so more vulnerable to COVID will also be more vulnerable to misinformation. But I think this is one of those hypotheses where we're, we're really interested to see what the results are because it is quite new territory. Uh, we also have some additional hypotheses and control factors, so age, gender, ethnicity, all of which have been shown to play a huge role in uh, your vulnerability to COVID and also vulnerability to misinformation. We've also got region because it's, uh, again, huge geographical variation, how COVID's unfolded, education, how much time you spend online, your personality traits, which we measure with the big five, and then also your political leaning. Um, and some of these also are control factors for our, our second research question, which I'll go into now. So our second research question to remind you is what features are associated with false health related content that people erroneously believe is true. So here we're looking at how can we manipulate different bits of content and understand how those features make an impact on people's assessment. So we're looking at three things. One is the sources of content. So is it a news provider? Is it a uh, health institution like the WHO or the government? Is it perhaps a more personal contact? And this is where political leaning really matters because for the news providers, we split them into left and right and high and low quality. We also look at how the medical claims are presented. So. Um, there's a very uh, fascinating part of internet culture called Betteridge's Law, which basically says that any news headline which finishes with a question mark, so it's a question, is almost definitely uh, to be answered in the negative, which of course is the challenge of clickbait. You see these incredibly exciting titles and you think, gosh, that's going to be so interesting. And the answer is nearly always no, that really scandalous, exciting, uh, revolutionary thing. It, it's not true. Um, so we think that's going to play quite a big role. So how we present the medical information. And then finally, the type of COVID-19 claims. So does it relate to the virus spreading, efforts to tackle the virus, the origins and causes? And, you know, these, these are likely to have an impact because there's a very different level of public understanding relating to each of those different topics. So I, I think it's good to give an update on where we've got to. Um, so we're, we're through with the research design phase. So we built out all of our hypotheses. I mean, we are now looking to do our pilot study, which is based on 150 people. And there may be some, a few clarifications that we make following that. And we will be putting it onto the open science framework. Um, after that point, we'll be ready to analyze the results and then move on to the full study. And we'll be delivering by September. At least that is the current timeline. I'd also like to say that we, we have confirmed the ethical, legal, compliance, data security requirements, and these are really important in, in this kind of research because we're asking people some very personal information. We have some information about their health, about their political leaning, um, about their outlook on a, on a wide range of issues. We're also exposing them to some misinformation. Of course, we have to do some very careful debriefing. Um, and so we really have gone through a lot of hoops to make sure this is right. And I'd just like to say once again, thank you to the Alan Turing Institute support team who have been able to make this possible. Uh, I'd also add how we're going to disseminate the results, because of course it's very important that we have a mechanism to share what we're doing. So we're doing workshops with policymakers and the Health Foundation. We're going to be organising a few blogs to make the findings more accessible. We're doing an events, you know, as many events as we can, such as this one. Initially in September, we'll deliver a technical report, which will have the interim results, and then that will lead into a full publication, which we're aiming to submit by December. Uh, so I'd really like to just say thank you very much for hosting me and for listening to me talk. This has been, uh, yeah, really, really exciting work. I'm really glad to share it. Um, if anyone has anything they want to follow up on, whether that's uh, advice or questions or just queries, please do email me. Um, and I'd be more than happy to have a chat about it. All right, thank you very much for your time.